This week on Waterways, recollaring Florida Panthers in Everglades National Park, and taking stock of the snook. Hiding in the wilderness of southern Florida is the largest endangered carnivore in the eastern United States, the Florida panther. This elusive and beautiful animal is rarely seen in public. For scientists to catch and tag one in Everglades National Park is a major operation that requires a team of people, dogs, climbing gear, an airplane, even a helicopter. The best way that we've found to capture these animals is by use of uh, trained dogs. And that's been the most efficient and quite honestly the safest way to do it. Uh, and so we have, uh, using the state's capture team, uh, they have a professional lion hunter, a houndsman, on uh, contract. And uh, he has trained lion dogs. And uh, what we do is we hunt for the animals. In Everglades National Park, resource managers have placed radio collars on panthers in order to track their movements. The batteries in the radio collars last about two to three years, so a team is assembled to recapture the panthers to replace the batteries before they run out. If the batteries are not replaced in time, the collar will stop sending a tracking signal, making it infinitely more difficult for researchers to find that particular panther again. The search for a tagged cat begins with an aerial survey to triangulate the panther's position. Mario Alvarado reports over the radio that he has picked up a signal in the southwestern part of Long Pine Key, within the boundaries of Everglades National Park. The team has hoped to reach the animal by truck, but in the area reported, there is no road access. The team on the ground gets as close as they can on foot and checks the signal to make sure they are close. The dogs are on standby and may have to be dropped in by helicopter. Here in Everglades, we do things a little bit differently. Um, th for example, this morning we're going after a recaller and uh, uh, the cat's in a place you can't access any way, other way except by helicopter. Uh, so uh, all this stuff needs to be uh, shuttled out there uh, and it's going to require, uh, you know, helicopters can only carry a certain amount of weight to be safe. So we have to, you know, weigh the gear and the people and make sure that everything is, uh, you know, adjusted accordingly so that we're not overloading the helicopter. Panther tracks are visible on the muddy ground. Nearby, Sonny Bass finds a fresh panther kill, probably a deer, which he estimates is between one and two days old. Panthers are carnivores, which means they only eat meat. About 90% of their diet is feral hog, white-tailed deer, raccoon, and armadillo. Occasionally, they consume rabbits, rats, and birds. And on rare occasions, they will eat small alligators. This is the fifth day in a row that the team has attempted to find this panther. If the cat gets away, they will have to start over again tomorrow. When the dogs find the panther, the chase can last about five to 10 minutes. Eventually, the panther will seek safety by climbing a tree. Once the cat is treed, it is shot with a tranquilizer. Uh, the capture went uh, fairly smoothly. The dogs trailed it through a, through a hammock and uh, we believe it's got a kill over there. Trailed it a short distance and jumped it, uh, went up a tree 
um, um, tallest tree in the hammock, but it was very small to begin with, probably 15 feet in the air maybe. Um, and then when it was darted, it, uh, it jumped out of the tree and then ran to the next one and then went up a cypress tree in the same hammock, didn't go far. And uh, then as the drug took effect, it fell out of the tree and we caught it in the net. And it's on the ground and it's being worked up. The Florida panther is one of more than 20 subspecies of cougar. The Florida panther is the same subspecies as other cougars from around the United States. Like the California cougar, sometimes called the mountain lion, as well as the Costa Rican puma. Male panthers inhabit around 250 square miles, fiercely protecting this area from other males. The female panther needs less area, about 80 square miles, which overlap with the male's territory. You know, panthers require huge areas. So what they need is they need contiguous space. They need big chunks of land to live. And quite honestly, that's why the panther still exists in South Florida, and it doesn't exist uh, documented anywhere else in the east. And the reason is that both the Everglades and Big Cypress and some of the surrounding areas like that represent what's left of that wilderness in the east. That's why panthers still live here. Once a panther ranged throughout Florida, as well as throughout much of the southeastern United States, early settlers considered them a threat to humans and livestock, so they were hunted almost to extinction. Later, loss of habitat would compound the problem. Fortunately, much of southwestern Florida was left relatively untouched by developers. But even though this natural sanctuary existed, resource managers estimated only 30 panthers in all of Florida in the early 70s. Not nearly enough to ensure the animal's survival. A classic problem with, with small populations is that they tend to breed with closely related individuals. So, and we've had that in Everglades. We've had, we've had mother-son inbreedings. We've had, you know, father-daughter inbreedings. We've had, uh, um, you know, so, I mean, those are the kinds of things that, that can cause problems. And so, uh, you, you want to have outside genes brought in because what can happen in situations like that is you can get uh, things that start to become fixed in a population. So things that can be detrimental, such as um, uh, heart defects. In the past, neighboring populations of cougar subspecies interbred, and traits were shared between subspecies. The Florida panther, however, has been isolated from other cougar populations for at least 100 years. The remaining panther population suffered from genetic defects and very low reproductive rates. So in 1974, it was reached an agreement that we would bring in an outside um, gene pool. This came from the closest population that was still in existence. This is one in Texas. We brought in eight females, introduced those animals into uh, various areas where the panthers occurred. Um, we brought two of those Texas females into Everglades National Park. And what we've been doing more recently is seeing and evaluating how that worked out. And so what we found was that the animals were, uh, showed uh, what we hoped they would show. Increased health, the animals appear to be healthier by the measures that uh, the veterinarians looked at, and uh, increased reproduction. In 2005, it was estimated that 50 to 70 panthers still lived in the wilds of Florida. With the inbreeding problem addressed, managers were able to focus on other issues. Over the past 24 years, 44 panthers have been killed on Florida's roads. To help prevent panthers being killed by collisions with cars, wildlife crossings and right-of-way fencing have been installed along more than 40 miles of roads that cross public lands. These fences have virtually eliminated panther deaths along the roadways they traverse. Now that doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet with this because what that takes is vigilance. I mean we have to monitor the animals and that's what we do now. At present we have only four animals in the park that are uh, have radio collars on them, but uh, we're, we're following their reproductive history. They're producing offspring, and those offspring are getting recruited into the population. 
During the collaring, the team conducts a general health profile, blood samples, stool samples. They check whether the panther is pregnant or lactating, and they will take hair samples to look for contaminants. They also collect the length and weight, and they will examine the teeth to see if there are any broken, an indication of the basic wear and tear on the animal. That usually takes about an hour, hour and a half, it depends. And, uh, and then we all leave. Uh, sometimes the veterinarian will give a reversal drug. It, it varies, sometimes they don't. See how the animal's doing. Everyone leaves and then we leave the animal to recover. And then obviously we monitor the animal um, closely with a radio telemetry to make certain that the animal recovers fine and gets up and starts moving. The collared panthers are tracked three times a week using a small plane equipped with antennas. Their movements are closely watched to ensure effective management decisions are made. The Florida panther will always be a managed population, and the staff of Everglades National Park has become stewards of the 10 to 12 panthers that make the park their home. It's not likely that we're ever gonna see 250 animals in South Florida, because there's probably not enough space for 250 animals. But what we do hope by doing that is that we can provide enough animals over wide enough range that the animals don't suffer from what they have in the past, such as inbreeding and things like that. But there's certainly no guarantee. When you have a small population, there are always threats there. So uh, it's, it's not like it is with some other uh, endangered species, say, peregrine falcons, which have been removed from the endangered species list. Uh, panthers are different. Um, chances are that animal will never be taken off the endangered species list. Once, panthers were hunted and killed out of fear. Now they are hunted so that Everglades National Park can help protect and care for them. If you would like to help protect the panther, and for more information, visit myfwc.com slash panther. Sometimes, the best way to study a fishery, the best way to figure out what's going on, the best way to measure management effectiveness is to tap into the local knowledge of an area in question. For fish population estimates, the people who may notice change first may be the fishermen trying to catch the species. There's one right there, you see him? Resource managers have long sought the knowledge that fishermen gather every day they spend on the water. To do this, someone locally must become part of the fishing community to gain fishermen's respect and trust. This is uh, Captain Rich Mitchell. And uh, Captain Mitchell, did you stick fish today? Yes, we did. All right. How many anglers on your boat actually fished? Two. Okay. And how long did you guys target snook for? Um, probably an hour and a half. Lisa Oakleman Labello works for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Her work includes an intercept program where biologists visit boat ramps, marinas, and bridges and talk to anglers who are fishing for snook. At the end of a long day of fishing though, some anglers are wary of stopping for a survey. However, Keys anglers are a different breed. These anglers are fully aware of how important the information they provide about snook can be. I think the, the snook research and surveys are a good thing because hopefully they'll improve the fishery in the future. More fish, bigger fish, and that's always good. When approaching anglers on the docks, Lisa has developed a friendly approach that these hardened fishing guides appreciate. Captain Gilman, how are you today? Good, Lisa, how are you? Good. Did you do any snook fishing today? We did, we Excellent. Did. How many fish did you catch? We caught five snook. Excellent. Okay, how many anglers did you have that were actually fishing? Three. It makes Lisa's job easier that she, too, is an angler. And her favorite fish is the snook. Based on angler surveys, snook was the fifth most targeted species on the Atlantic coast and fourth on the Gulf Coast in 2004. There are four species of snook in Florida waters. 
common snook, tarpon snook, small-scale fat snook, and swords pine snook. In South Florida, the common snook is the most abundant of the four species. Snook can tolerate a wide range of salinities and may even be found in fresh water. However, they are extremely sensitive to changes in temperature. I probably have to say that snook are one of the more intelligent fish. Uh, they don't like to waste a lot of effort on getting something to eat. They tend to, um, you know, kind of back into the mangrove prop roots. They'll sit next to structure like a dock post or a bridge piling. Um, and they'll kind of wait for the water to move and watch the bait going by. And then they kind of jump out and handpick what they want and go back in. And they, they eat until they're full. And then when they're done, they're done. The SNCC Research Program is actually the umbrella to a lot of other experiments, if you want to call them experiments, um, or projects like sub-projects that we have going on. We've got our intercept program, which is what I'm talking to you about today. We've also got our catch and release program, uh, where we have two teams of biologists, one in the Charlotte Harbor area and one in the Tequesta area, which is up, up in the border of Palm Beach, Martin Counties, um, on the East Coast. And what they do is they go out on random catch and release trips, just like a regular angler would. And then what we do is we, we compare the catch data from those catch and release trips that our biologists take with the catch data that we get through our angler, our angler intercepts, as well as um, an additional facet to the program, which is our logbook program. We have anglers and guides that take long-term data down for us when they record it in a, in a, in a book. Um, and that data also gets put into our entire, the entire pile of data that we collect from all the, all the facets of the program. And so everything kind of interconnects with each other. Snook Research also takes Lisa into the lab. The data collected on the docks is complemented by an occasional snook specimen that is dissected for data. Among the information collected, the snook's age. So right now I'm removing the otolith. And bony fish have otoliths. Um, they are meant for picking up vibrations, just like our ear bones. Um, each fish has three on each side. This is the major one. The other two are much smaller. Once they are removed, they're cleaned and dried, and they are mounted on a slide after they've been sectioned. They take the center uh, piece out, and they're then mounted on a slide which is finished like this. Much like the rings on a tree, the otolith, or ear bone of the snook, has lines for each year of the snook's life. Comparing the length of the snook with its age is an indication of how well the ecosystem is supporting snook. Snook scientists can also test the chemical composition of the otolith and determine where the snook have lived. The oldest recorded snook in Florida was 21 years old. Snook are all born male, and between the ages of two and seven, approximately 50% turn to female. This is called prodantric hermaphrodism. Snook was declared a species of special concern in 1982. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission enforces a slot size on snook. You cannot keep any snook that are less than 26 inches in total length and you can't keep any snook that are greater than 34 inches in total length. The snook slot is considered a close-ended slot, meaning there is a minimum and a maximum size for the allowed catch, versus many fisheries that have only a minimum. In addition to a slot, there is a bag limit on how many snook you can keep, and there is a summer and short winter closed season. That's All three of these management there. tools are helping to ensure a future for the snook fishery. So stop, stop. There you go. Now you've got a snook. Now you've got a snook. Nice. Bite them out of those There you go. Just rock them home and just keep them There you go. That's it. Boy, they want to go to the branch, don't they? Yep. 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 
don't like to keep them out of the water too long. You want to keep them in the water as much as possible. Anytime you're doing catch and release fishing, the least amount of time out of the water is, is the best possible thing for the fish. This guy's almost ready to go. All right, you ready? We'll let this guy go. The life history part is the key to knowing, you know, what you do next. In other words, what your next management decision is. And I think the biggest impacts were cutting the bag limit on the Gulf Coast down to one, um, pulling the slot up to 26, and closing it at 34. In other words, not allowing any trophy fish anymore. Those those trophy fish, I think, saving those fish was probably the best thing that we did. And now we're seeing an increase in, in catch and release of the larger fish that are out of the slot. Those are normally females. Um, the, the more you get out of the slot, you know, 35, 36, 37 inches, uh, the higher the percentage is that it's going to wind up being a female. More female snook mean more eggs and eventually more snook for the fishery. Lisa acknowledges that without the help and cooperation from local anglers, the study would not work. The response from these anglers has been very positive, and Lisa and her fellow researchers find very few people that don't want to participate. These researchers are often anglers themselves, and therefore, they are sensitive to the nuances of the work, such as not recording anglers' secret spots. If you want to help the program, um, you can either um, donate your catch data, um, you can get in touch with any one of the regional biologists and they're all listed in the website. Um, you can email catch data from one day, you can email catch data from three weeks, you can do a log book, you can do just sheets of paper if you want to write your catch on there. It's, it's all, I don't turn anybody away. I don't, if I have one guy that fishes one time a year for snook and he wants to donate his catch data to me, that's perfect. Snook anglers can also help by bringing their filleted snook carcasses to local participating bait and tackle stores. These researchers ask that you only donate a carcass you would have kept anyway. And be sure that the organs of the fish are intact and the back is not broken. The best way to protect the future of this fish is to properly catch and release your snook. And remember, it is against the law to buy or sell snook. Snook data is collected in all parts of Florida, not just the Keys. To help protect the future of one of Florida's premier inshore game fish, and to learn more about regulations, visit research.myfwc.com. <laughs>